Monday that that will happen is October 2nd. It's a real quick read. So, you know, uh, I would also ask if it's a husband and wife and you're interested, just take one copy. So we only have a limited enough. That's about 15 here. I'm taking some for book club. But, um, so after this is over, if you're interested in a copy, come see me while they last. And as I said, I think we have, what, two and three copies at the yes, library? Yeah, we have and I'll make my copy available that we can check out on also. So if there's a big demand. All right? So I want to share that about Lucy's book, and you can get a copy after this is over. All right. 
Welcome everybody to the 16th Annual Armchair Traveler. Thank you so much for coming and thank you to our friends for sponsoring this and making it all happen. I mean, we couldn't do it without them. We love our friends. Um, and we are excited today uh, to have Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lidwood Hay... Uh, <laughs> We're slow. We're slow with us here today. I'm sorry, I can't speak. My tongue's all tied up this day right now. Uh, Linwood Winslow here for, here with us today, and he is uh, a local expert on Quaker history as well as a M educator, professor, um, and he is also, and many of you probably already know, uh, the director of the Albemarle Corral. Um, and he is going to share with us the history, 350 years of history of Quakers in Northeast uh, North Carolina and the Albemarle region, uh, as titled the Friends of the Albemarle, as he had titled it. And so we are so pleased to have him today. Today, So give him a big applause. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here today. It speaks about something uh, very near and dear to my heart, my own personal heritage, both uh, genealogically and in faith as well, because I am a Quaker, um, and family has been as long as there have been Quakers in Northeastern North Carolina. So, um, hope you will enjoy this. Uh, you will please um, forgive me for reading, but if I just speak from notes or off the top of my head, um, we might get finished about 9 or 10 tonight. <laughs> I have a tendency to ramble, and I'm already starting to do that. <laughs> um, so I know it's better for me to stick to what is on the printed page, so I will do that. Um, but first, there's nothing wrong with a little uh, blatant self-promotion. Uh, I am a member of the board of the Provost County Restoration Association, and if you notice there are some little um, counter cards for the New Bowl White House over here. And not this Saturday, but next Saturday, we are having what we call Jollification, which is an annual event. Um, we have a good time, but we also have a tour of historic homes and sites. This year it's in Belvedere, my home community. And um, I don't know what I was thinking. I agreed to have two houses um, on the tour, so I'm in the middle of trying to get those ready. And also stupidly started a couple of um, renovation projects on one of them that I'm trying to wind up in time for this. So come and join us. Uh, you can visit our website or Facebook page to get more information and uh, get me for having to slip that in there. So this is the Armchair Traveler series, so I would like to invite you to join me for a bit of travel. But you can keep your seats. It's not distance we will cover, but time. Come with me back across more than three centuries to early spring of 1672. Perquimans River looks pretty much as you would see it today in Hertford or down across the field in Evo White House Pier. But the country through which it snakes its slow winding course is sickly forested with stands of towering cypress and pines, massive oaks, hickories, and beech. Here and there, a small clearing has been hacked from the wilderness, and crops are being planted in rather small, rotting but stubborn stumps. <clears throat> These tiny farmsteads hug the river and its tributaries. Tannin-stained waters a better road to the neighbors than any woodland deer path. On the side of the new old White House lived Joseph Scott and his family, probably in a much smaller timber version of the fine brick house that would come later. Across the river lies the home of Francis Toms, my eighth great grandfather. And about a mile back at the Narrows, where the new S Bridge, I think maybe we need to call that the new old bridge now, but anyway, uh, the new S Bridge now lands, Henry and Hannah Phelps and their family have spent the last seven years establishing a homestead. These and the other settlers have little opportunity for diversion for their, from their work, carving out a bit of the old England in the new world. So they're pleasantly surprised to receive word of a traveler at the Phelps home who will hold some sort of meeting at noon. Boats are quickly manned and launched, children herded onto the shortest trail, and the populace converges at Henry Phelps' door. Imagine the greeting exchanged, the hubbub of expectancy. Does this man bring news from home? Will he sing and dance, deliver a political speech? 
tell jokes and juggle. We shall see. Refreshed by a short nap, but still dirty and disheveled from over a year of travel, the newcomer emerges. The people quiet themselves. He waits. The quiet deepens to silence. And he waits. Finally, he rises, speaks, and for the first time, the gospel of Christ is preached in Carolina. The people's hearts are touched, their spirits moved by the simple message of light and love he brings to this wilderness outpost. William Edmondson, for that is the speaker's name, stays for several days meeting with and preaching to the people of Albemarle. When he leaves them, they're ready to continue meeting together for worship and spiritual communion. For the faith he has shared with them requires no chapel or priest, no prayer book or chalice. It is distilled to the most basic elements, the worshiper and the worship, coming together in silence, the worshiper ready to listen, to speak if prompted by the Holy Spirit, a light at the end. What year was that? 1672. 351 years. In the fall of that same year, George Fox, heartened by reports of Edmondson's tender reception, makes the trek south from New England to reinforce his companion's work in the wilderness, stopping for a time at a little place in Virginia called Summerton, where a meeting would be established. After staying with the governor of the colony on the Chowan near present-day Edenton, Fox records in his journal, We entered our boat and went that day about 30 miles to the house of Joseph Scott, one of the representatives of the country. There we had a sound, precious meeting. The people were tender and much desired after meetings. His 18-day sojourn preaching in the Albemarle ensures that the seed planted in the black soil of the women will take firm root. Who were these men? Willing to take on the rigors of an Atlantic crossing and two years of slogging through miles of untamed swamp and forest to spread their message. Today, we would call them members of the Society of Friends, or Quakers. But they call themselves variously seekers, children of light, or friends of truth. Their movement was rooted in the turmoil of mid-17th century England, where society and the church were being ripped apart and remade through civil war, regicide, the Puritan movement, and the restoration of the monarchy. In this struggle for a path to true faith, the young George Fox, son of a weaver from the north of England, began to feel unease with the established church. He sought guidance from priests and was told to take up smoking. <laughs> from his friends and was told to join the army. Not much help. In 1652, after much wandering and searching, he found himself tending sheep alone on top of Pendle Hill high above the grassy, windswept moors of his home. In the silence of that hilltop, he heard the voice of God answering his search at last. There is one, even Christ Jesus, who can speak to thy condition. How much simpler could it be? The way to truth, the way to faith, was not through society, not through forms and rituals, not through a priesthood established and maintained by the government. It is through Christ alone, whose still small voice will speak if we but give him our ear and our attention. Every man, woman, and child can do that, regardless of any outward condition of rank or wealth, for every individual has that spark of the divine, that of God within, the inner light, which responds to and reflects the light of Christ. Fox's experience on Pendle Hill was accompanied by a vision of a great people to be gathered, and he spent the rest of his life preaching what he had found. Over the 20 years which passed between that first opening and his journey to Carolina, the movement grew rapidly, spreading through Great Britain, across the Channel to Europe, and even to Turkey where the servant girl Mary Fisher traveled on foot to publish truth before the Sultan and his court. The basic belief in the inner life, that of God in everyone, 
Let these early friends of truth to lead lives guided by the Holy Spirit and exemplified by simplicity, honesty, equality, and peace. Their absolute faith in the power of God and His guidance made them bold enough to share their faith and their views with any and all they met, be it peasant farmer or nobleman, fishwife or chief, chief justice's wife, Lord protector or king. Persecuted by Anglicans and Puritans alike as heretics and troublemakers, by the time Fox came to the colonies, Quakers were among the officially banned sects in many New World settlements. Virginia's Governor Berkeley felt sufficiently threatened in 1660 that he instituted a campaign to drive all Quakers and Baptists, he's equal opportunity, <laughs> from his colony. The family of Henry Phelps had fled such treatment when they moved from New England south to the sparsely settled Carolinas. It is clear from Edmondson's journal that the Phelps were friends before they met him, for they wept with joy at his arrival as he was the first Quaker they had seen in seven years. Records detail the sufferings of friends in Isle of Wight County and Nanceman County in Virginia. Beatings, imprisonment, confiscation of property. It's no wonder that many, like the Phelps and the Jordans, another branch of my own family tree, finally felt the need to leave the Old Dominion. The colony where they sought safety was being largely ignored by the Anglican Church, which sent no priests, no missionaries to comfort the settlers or convert the natives. Even more importantly, in an effort to attract settlers, the colony's 1663 charter granted freedom and liberty of conscience in all religious or spiritual things. With these two sunny conditions, the seeds Edmonton and Fox sowed not only took root, but sprouted and grew rapidly. In the earliest years, Meetings for worship were held in or near various homes. <coughs> By the end of the century, these had grown to such an extent they were pretty much established in set locations. And thought was being given to constructing buildings set aside specifically for the use of friends. The first of these was settled on the property of William Bogue on the river, just above the present day windfall, and was referred to as the meeting on the northeast side of the Narrows of the Quermans River. <laughs> a little bit of a mouthful. So they shortened that to the Upper Meeting House and eventually to Wits. The 1704 deed transferring this property to Friends indicates that the Meeting House already stood there. Further downriver, Friends met alternately at the home of Francis <coughs> Toms and Christopher Nicholson, eventually building a meeting house on the Toms Plantation, deeded to the Society in 1705. Known as the Lower Meeting House, this later came to be called Old Neck Meeting. In Pascatine County, worship was held as early as 1690 at Silence Creek at the home of Henry White, another immigrant from Virginia. Friends gathered on Sunday and Wednesday, or to use traditional terms, first day and fourth day, for times of worship. Gathering in silence with no liturgy, no pre-planned sermon, no music, they would wait for the Holy Spirit to speak to them individually, the still small voice of God communicating directly to the heart and soul of the worshiper. If led, a friend would rise and share the message or opening laid on his or her heart. Sometimes brief, sometimes long, these were the vocal ministry of the society. In addition to the weekly meetings for worship, as the society grew, special meetings were held once each month to consider business and concerns. Called quite simply, monthly meeting. These meetings for worship for business probably at first rotated between the established meeting places. As each individual place of worship became permanent, the particular group of friends who gathered there regularly began to hold its own monthly meeting to deal with concerns of its members. As in worship, friends here followed no set agenda and depended on the guidance of the Holy Spirit to help them make necessary decisions. As the monthly meetings became more independent of one another, a quarterly meeting was set up for representatives to come together every three months for business concerning the whole body of friends in Albemarle. The final organizational step in the early development of friends in North Carolina was taken in 1697 when it was approved to hold yearly meeting the last seventh day of seventh month of each year at the home of Francis Thomas. The 
first session of North Carolina yearly meeting was held the following year, and though racked by some upheaval and splits since that time, it has continued regularly to meet ever since, making it, I believe, the oldest continuing organization in the state of North Carolina. <coughs> Don't quote me on that. During the last quarter of the 17th century and the first decade of 18th, <coughs> friends dominated the landscape of North Carolina. In the minutes of the early meetings, you'll find a virtual roll call of who's who in colonial proclivities. Nixon, Toms, White, Winslow, Nicholson, Wilson, Scott, Sutton, Newby, Clare. As Fox noted in his journal, Joseph Scott was a representative, a member of the General Assembly, which at times met at his home. Gabriel Newby likewise served in this body, and his father-in-law, Francis Toms, was a member of the council, deputy collector of customs, and the justice of the peace. In addition, he worked closely with John Archdale, himself a Quaker and governor from 1683 to 86, and again from 1695 to 97. Through men such as these, friends held control of the government, enabling them to create an environment which was not only lenient towards, but attractive to friends. Among matters of legislation was Archdale's act exempting friends from military service on conscientious principles. Because in all other civil matters, they have been persons obedient to government and very ready to disburse their monies and other necessary and public needs. The influence of friends in North Carolina also led to peaceful relation with native Indians, both privately and officially. Tenor of Carolina politics was reflected in a letter from the devout Anglican Henderson Walker to the Bishop of London, and he wrote, My Lord, I humbly beg leave to inform you that we have an assembly to meet November 3rd, 1703. Over one half of the Burgesses are Quakers. If your Lordship, out of good and pious care for us, doth not put a stop to their growth, we shall, for the most part, especially the children born here, become heathen. <laughs> he didn't have a high opinion of Quakers. <laughs> While this letter is evidence of the powers wielded by Quakers in the early years of the colony, the sentiment it expresses sounded the death knell for that very power. As the colony grew, so did the number of non-Quakers, and a struggle for power ensued. Increasing insistence on taking oaths of allegiance in order to serve in public office conflicted directly with the Quaker following of Christ's admonition to swear not at all. During the tenure of Edward Hyde, appointed governor by the proprietors in 1710, friends were systematically forced from the political arena, and their golden age came to an end. Okay. <laughs> Despite this political setback, friends continued to grow and prosper in private life with new meetings established throughout the 18th century. The new begun meeting was settled in Pasquotank County around 1707 by Joseph Jordan, a friend from Chuckatuck, Virginia, who came to Carolina after suffering years of repeated imprisonment, physical abuse, and confiscation of property. Little River Meeting was set up in 1715 on the plantation of Christopher and Mary Nicholson, where a meeting house was built in 1733. Friends were meeting at the home of Samuel Newby in the early 1720s and built Piney Woods Meeting House west of Newby's Bridge, now Belvedere, in 1744. During the last half of the 18th century, meetings were established and meeting houses built at Sutton's Creek. Sutton's Creek, Bosses Creek, Beach Spring, and the Narrows of the Pasco Tank, making a total of eight meetings in Perquillens and three in Pasco Tank. Sorry, there were none established in Chowan, though there were friends living in Chowan County. They just crossed the line of Perquillens to worship the Piney Woods. <coughs> These friends must have made a striking contrast to others of their day. Here you can see where those meetings were located. In dress, they were simple, in speech, plain, honest, and democratic, refusing the plural you in favor of the singular thee and thou. The women of the society enjoyed freedoms their Anglican sisters would never have dreamed of, 
speaking in worship whenever led, and holding their own business meetings. Quaker children also led lives different than their neighbors. Boys and girls educated side by side in the meeting schools, taught all things civil and useful <coughs> in an age when most girls only learned cookery and needlework. But in this progressive and egalitarian lifestyle, there was a problem. Look at the wills and estate inventories tucked into the fine walnut desks of prosperous friends, which showed that among the silver tankers and livestock, they list human chattels, slaves, as the quest to their children. Though friends were admonished by Fox to treat their servants and slaves with tender care, they at first saw no conflict between saying that there is that of God in someone and then claiming ownership of that same person. However, as they approached the mid-18th century and slaveholding became more and more prevalent in the colonies, this dichotomy began to make itself clear to them. Slowly and somewhat painfully, they began to divest themselves of their human property. John Woolman, a friend from New Jersey, dedicated his life to traveling among friends, preaching to them, showing them the evil of slavery. In 1757, he traveled to North Carolina, recording in his journal, from thence to Piney Woods. This was the last meeting I was at in Carolina, and was large, and my heart being deeply engaged, I was drawn forth into a fervent labor amongst them. Once friends saw that they could no longer hold slaves, the problems they faced were manifold. The year following Woolman's visit, 1758, both Wells and Piney Woods meeting houses burned. Now there's, the minutes are unclear as to exactly what happened, but there has been speculation that these were cases of arson, brought on by the growing unpopularity of friends' new views on the holding of slaves. By 1772, the yearly meeting urged friends not to buy or sell slaves from anyone other than friends, except in cases where it was done to prevent the separation of families, indicating a growing concern for the welfare of slaves as people. In an effort to stop the increase of slavery, the yearly meeting, this is the problem with reading something, you can't look at something and look away. The early meeting also petitioned the House of Burgesses to ban the importation of slaves into the colony. I reworked an older PowerPoint, and I didn't realize these bullets had to come up separately, so I apologize for that. Um, in 1774, Thomas Newby, wealthy owner of Belvedere Plantation, approached Quimman's monthly meeting asking for advice on freeing his slaves as he no longer felt clear to hold them. In order to do anything major like that, he went to the monthly meeting and saw guidance and permission. This was, this was considered too weighty to be handled on the local level, and his concern was forwarded to the yearly meeting. In discussions, concerns were expressed over remaining within the law and also on the future welfare of the slaves once they were free. Would they be able to make a living? Would they about to be allowed to live free? The issue moved slowly, but at last it had begun to move. In 1776, the yearly meeting appointed a committee to assist friends in freeing slaves, agreeing to help defray any legal costs, and instructing monthly meetings to protect freed slaves from recapture. These were real necessities since 18th century laws prohibited the manumission of slaves for any reason other than meritorious service, which had to be proved in county court. Any slaves freed outside the law were subject to arrest and resale by the county. Frustrated by the slow workings of the yearly meeting, Thomas Newby decided that he could wait no longer. In 1777, he and nine other Quakers in Quimmins County freed some 40 slaves the first instance in North Carolina of such a step. Many of the freed slaves were terrified as they had never known any other life. Some begged to be allowed to remain with their former owners and to be bound to them for life as free servants. Their fears were realized when nearly all were recaptured and sold back into slavery. The legislature reacted with harsher laws and penalties which targeted friends 
Petitions by the yearly meeting explained that they were acting on the principle that freedom is the natural right of all mankind and that holding people in bondage is against Christ's injunction to do to others as we would be done by. <coughs> Friends accused the North Carolina <coughs> legislature of violating the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights by applying a new law to an act which had taken place years before. This petition was signed by the same ten men who had freed the slaves and proponents. It was the beginning of almost a century of legal, moral, and physical struggle on the part of friends in North Carolina to free their slaves and to free themselves from the sin of slavery. Friends tried many avenues toward freedom and began to physically remove former slaves from the region. As a legal stopgap to prevent capture and resale, the yearly meeting in 1808 began accepting title to formerly enslaved people, allowing them to live and work as free while protected within the legal system. Ironically, this made the largest anti-slavery organization within the state also its largest slave owner. <laughs> Exporting former slaves to western free states, to Haiti, and to the new colony of Liberia and Africa were tried as routes to freedom. Considering costs and dangers, transportation to the West became the preferred route, and friends regularly organized trips from North Carolina to Indiana and Ohio. In 1826, a group of young friends, and I'm not exactly sure what they considered young friends back there, we usually consider those teenagers, so I'll go with that, organized another such trip purchasing 12 horses and 13 carts and wagons. Now, I haven't figured that out. <laughs> Unless somebody took their own horse and pulled one of the carts. But anyway, that's what the records say. At a cost of $2,490, which they borrowed personally, on a journey that took six weeks, one way, they carried 133 formerly enslaved persons, the lives of freedom in Indiana. By 1848, it was reported that all but 12 to 15 of the former slaves under the care of the yearly meeting had been removed from the state. It is thought that as many as 1,685 had been transported officially, but many more were probably moved with friends who moved west or north, all done as much within the law as possible. North Carolina Yearly Meeting sent repeated appeals for the extermination of slavery to the legislature, and similar petitions were sent to Congress. In 1843, the Yearly Meeting issued an advice to its members against harboring fugitive slaves or interfering between master and slave, but this was soon changed to advising friends to do what they must in good conscience to help freed slaves. Friends were very active in the Underground Railroad. However, the written records of the yearly and monthly meetings are understandably silent on this highly secret, dangerous, and illegal work. Letters have recently been found suggesting a network transporting freed and runaway slaves from friends in the Goldsboro area up to Perquimans and Chowan, then to Northampton County, and on to friends in Isle of Wight, Virginia, where they continued north or west to freedom. An unexpected result of this work was that many friends, tired of the struggle against slavery in their native North Carolina and attracted by the availability of cheap, fertile land in the West, made the trip to transport freed slaves and never returned. In 1824, Samuel Wilson, owner of the house and farm where I currently live, requested certificates of membership from the Women's Monthly Meeting to Whitewater Monthly Meeting in what is now Richmond, Indiana, and moved his entire family. David White, a prominent friend in Belvedere who was active in the work of abolition, finally moved to Indiana himself in 1840. This was repeated across North Carolina and the South. Some friends' meetings moved as a body. Others were so depleted of members that they were laid down completely. Between 1800 and 1861, 83 meetings were laid down. All Quakers left Carteret, Beaufort, Hyde, Craven, and Jones counties. By 1854, 
all of meetings in Perquimans and Pasquotank counties had been laid down except one, Piney Woods, just beyond the Belvedere Plantation of Thomas Newby, where the anti-slavery work of friends in northeastern North Carolina got its start. And here you can see where meetings were spread across the state, some in South Carolina, Virginia, and Tennessee, and all of those marked with a cross were suspended before 1861. These were dark times for friends in Perquimans, indeed for friends anywhere in the South. But as the conflict over slavery flared into war, the remnant of friends at Piney Woods, and this is Piney Woods, weathered the storm with remarkable resilience. Incredibly, after a half century of decline and five years of civil war, friends in Perquimans had enough faith and optimism to start their first new meeting since 1795. In 1866, members of Piney Woods living up the river requested permission to hold meetings for worship in their schoolhouse as the distance to the meeting house was too great to travel conveniently and perhaps safely in post-war climate. This request was granted and Upriver Friends Meeting was established. Friends at Upriver continued to meet in the schoolhouse until 1875 when the first upriver meeting house was constructed. It stood a short distance to the northwest of the present structure, just across from the upriver cemetery. In 100 years up the river, Carlton Ranchery describes the old meeting house as follows. The first meeting house was one large 50 by 40 foot weatherboarded structure. <clears throat> On the inside, a gallery stretched across the front end. The gallery was one step above the main floor. Benches extended the entire length of the gallery on which sat the ministers and the elders. There was also a bench in front of the gallery on each side of the aisle facing the congregation for the use of overseers particularly and other concerned friends. The library books, because every meeting had a library, used to be housed in a case that went into the gallery. An aisle ran from the center double doors at the front end to the gallery. A single door was in the middle of each side of the house. You can see that here. Double door and a single on the side. Connected these doors. A large stove in which wood was burned for heat when needed stood in the middle in the aisle in front of the cross aisle. The windows of the meeting house were large and contained many small clear window lights. Kerosene lamps with reflectors were attached to the upright pillars which furnished support for the roof. The top of the meeting room was sealed and the sides were plastered. By 1884, both the Upper River and Piney Woods meeting houses were in a bad state, and friends caught in the lean years of reconstruction could not afford the necessary repairs. Having received aid from the North before, Piney Woods Monthly Meeting appealed to Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, and funds were given from the Charleston Fund for repairing and painting the two buildings. Throughout this difficult time, Northern Friends extended aid and encouragement to Friends in the South. Books from Philadelphia Friends and the Baltimore Association received by the meetings became the nucleus of the current meeting libraries, the books formerly housed in a case on the gallery, and later in a separate building on the Upper River Meeting House grounds. By the beginning of the 20th century, the growth of the congregation at Up River and the need for space for first day school classes spurred construction of a new meeting house. The present building was constructed in 1914 and except for a few alterations was pretty much what you would see today. The meeting room oriented towards the long wall in accordance with traditional Quaker construction had at its front a railed gallery furnished with a facing bench instead of the modern pulpit furniture which you would see now if you were to go to the meeting house. Although the main benches were newly constructed, thrift and perhaps sentiment caused the benches from the old meeting house to be brought over and reused in the classrooms at the front and rear of the new building. The new meeting house was lit by some type of gas or early battery electric powered lights. I'm not exactly sure. My great uncle Vivian White enjoyed telling the story of how it was his responsibility as a small boy to keep the plant going which fueled or powered these lights. One first day morning during worship, the lights went out. After worship, he received a lesson from his father. The lights never went out again. 
A new building for upriver was not the only change occurring for Friends in the Albemarle during this period. At the end of the 19th century, a movement swept the entire nation, which we now refer to as the Great Revival, bringing with it new forms of worship and an emphasis on emotionalism. The youth of many denominations were attracted by something new and different, much as we see people today leaving traditional churches for those centered around contemporary music and worship. Nothing new, what it's mm -hmm. Friends were not immune to this. In many country meetings, such as Piney Woods and Upriver, the homegrown leadership had weakened, and vocal ministry was not what it had once been. And to stem the loss of members, Friends began to adopt some of the new methods. Music, which had apparently been accepted into the home sometime before, was slowly introduced into Sunday schools and then into meetings for worship. Where resident ministers were no longer in place, hired pastors were sought. At Piney Woods, the 1854 building, which you saw in the earlier picture, was totally renovated, removing the shutters dividing men and women and replacing the gallery and facing benches with a pulpit and chairs, a development which did not take place at Upriver until around 1960. By the 1920s, Piney Woods was considering hiring a full-time minister. The yearly meeting adopted the new uniform discipline of the five years meeting, now Friends United meeting, and matters came to a head. Many older, um, many older members could not in good conscience embrace the new ways and withdrew forming what we now know as North Carolina Yearly Meeting Conservative. Friends at Woodland and Rich Square, at that time part of Eastern Quarter along with Piney Woods and Upriver, withdrew as a body. Older members of Piney Woods built a meeting house a short distance away called Snow Hill after the old Mitchell Ward plantation on which it stood, and it was in Chilwan County. Barely. It was in Chilwan County. My great aunt Mary White was called going there with her grandparents and sitting in silence during the long first day mornings. She would wait eagerly for the two men on the facing bench to begin rubbing their hands because that meant that they would soon shake hands and meeting would be over. <laughs> the slow Quakers, as they were called, met there until there were just two, Maddie Saunders and Minnie Rantree. They continued to meet together faithfully, just the two of them, as long as they could walk to the meeting house and light a fire. Piney Woods and Upriver continued to meet together for business through the early years of the 20th century, men and women still meeting separately for business until 1906, roughly the same time that they stopped sitting apart in worship. A separate meeting for business that concerned only Upriver was allowed beginning in 1927, and in 1946, Upriver was granted independent monthly meeting status. Due to the declining health of resident minister Elizabeth White, who had served Upriver for over 50 years, the first hired pastor was brought to Upriver in 1953. As long as they were able, Elizabeth White and fellow recorded minister Gideon Saunders continued to sit on the facing bench with the pastor and shared in worship as they were there. As a matter of fact, um, Elizabeth White, who I grew up, I never knew her. She died before I was born, but um, she was my great, great aunt. So she was Aunt Lizzie. Um, and I was, have read that she continued to attend meeting until the week before she died and actually spoke in meeting that day. I mentioned earlier that Upriver was begun in the Friends Schoolhouse in that community. Quakers have recognized and stressed the importance of education from the earliest days of the society. Friends in Pasquotank County supported the first public school in Carolina at Simons Creek in 1705, and generally established, Friends generally established schools near their meeting houses to see that their children were well educated. By 1833, need and interest had both progressed to the point that Eastern Quartal Quarter developed the select boarding school of the Eastern Quarterly Meeting of North Carolina. They really like long titles. <laughs> Later known simply as Belvedere Academy. For the higher education of local and non-local students and the training of future teachers. This, this institution was begun almost simultaneously with New Garden Boarding School in what is now Greensboro 
which eventually became Guilford College, and was probably run on similar lines. Existing photographs from the late 19th century, very dim, show that the academy was housed in what appeared to be a two-story frame house with a full-height porch and a rather rough belfry on top. A little thing here. It's hard to see in uh, it's harder to see here than in real life in the picture. I apologize. The uneasiness of friends around anything resembling a steeple is evident in this somewhat uncouth <laughs> appendage. <laughs> Students from long distances away were boarded with local families, and the house in which I live was home of the overseer in charge of boarding students in the first years of the school's operation. The original academy building was replaced in 1904 with a very handsome Victorian structure of two stories with an octagonal bell and entry tower and double porches with intricate latticework railings across, <clears throat> got lost again, a far cry from Quaker simplicity indeed. <laughs> Things had changed. The old structure was sold and moved across the road where it was completely remodeled as a dwelling, which still stands today. The academy continued to be operated by friends until it was sold to the county in 1914 to become a public school. In the 1930s, it burned to the ground and with the consolidation of county schools at Windfall and Hertford, was never rebuilt. Through the years, further changes in worship, ideas, membership, outlook, and buildings have taken place, and they continue to do so. Like many other denominations, Friends have faced both internal and external pressure and conflict. Several years back, North Carolina Yearly Meeting, affiliated with Friends United Meeting, underwent a division, restructuring, and a loss of meetings, which I fear will weaken its ability to continue sharing the unique Christian message the Society of Friends. Up River and Piney Woods have both withdrawn and are now independent bodies. Eastern Quarterly Meeting, which actually predated the yearly meeting, no longer exists. The unity and fellowship with held, which held Friends and the Albemarle together in a common purpose for over 300 years has been splintered. And I fear that even though the 21st century still finds Quakers in the Albemarle area, our identity and presence as friends may be fast disappearing. But we're not yet here. We're still here. And we continue to meet both the Piney Woods and at Up River. That building that you saw in the Pine Woods. And one thing that I would have tried to point out, but it's almost impossible to see. There is a pig in the front of that old picture. <laughs> the person that loaned it to me had to point it out to me to almost out like, but there is, it's a big hog. <laughs> um, that building was completely remodeled to this. The second upriver meeting house um, has been added onto three times, and this picture actually doesn't show the most recent addition, which extends further that way. Um, both meetings continue to meet on Sunday mornings for worship at 11. Anyone's welcome to join us. And, um, oh, I finished before 6 30. <laughs> I appreciate your attention. Um, if anybody has questions, I will try to answer. I won't promise that I know everything because I certainly don't. Lynn, um, I just wondered what, what is the origin or history of such accurate record keeping? Like, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, you know, in other religions, um, you know, it's a reference for genealogy, too, and yep. all kinds of stuff. There is a real purpose. I'm glad you asked that. Um, because friends, so early on, separated themselves from the established church um, and refused to attend, uh, originally they didn't want to separate. They wanted to purify, like the Puritans. They wanted to, to change... The, the Church of England, but that didn't happen. And when they realized it wasn't going to happen, which was real quick, um, they started meeting on their own, just like the first friends here in homes. And they got in trouble for that because there were laws that you had to attend the established church. 
Well, they were constantly getting hauled off to jail and punished because they didn't go. Boy, that wouldn't go over. <coughs> um, but because of that, they also were not married within the established church. And that's where the records were kept, the legal records. There were many cases of people coming back years later when a couple passed away and non-Quaker relatives would say they were not legally married. Therefore, their children are illegitimate. They cannot inherit. This property is ours. And many times it was supported by the court. And so friends began to keep records of everything they did so that they would have that record to show, not just of that, but also births recorded, um, transactions recorded, their actions recorded, so there was no question about what had happened um, and what had taken place. And it was also a little bit of a, um, a harkening back to um, you know, the, the unwritten laws of England, you know, they have an unwritten constitution um, that is based on precedent. And so as you made a decision, that decision became a precedent for future decisions. And so they needed to be recorded, and you needed to be able to go back and, and look at that. Um, the minutes are all kept now at Guilford, um, except the current minutes that an individual meeting is, is currently working with. Um, there are some gaps, but for the most part, they are continuous back to the late 17th century. Um, I served as reporting clerk for Upriver for about 30 years, and for Eastern Quarter for 15 or 20. And it was really something to know that I was continuing something that had been done since well before this country was established as an independent country. They were a threat to the established church. Um, anyone who was not attending the established church was not paying their tithes to the established church. And that was a legal requirement. And um, so it was, they, they were considered a threat. Just, and as I said, the Baptists too, because they were not doing that. And any other group who was not towing the line. I have, a, I have a question with a little back, quick back story. When I first graduated from college back in the 70s, I taught at Virginia Beach Friends School, Quaker School. I was a died and will Methodist, but I really found an affinity to their meeting for worship. Every morning we had a mostly silent meeting for worship amongst the staff, and every week the children would come and we'd have a meeting for worship within the meeting house. This is in Virginia Beach. This is still there. And that's where I learned about how important education was to the Quakers. My younger daughter also graduated from upper school, at from school. Anyway, so years and years and years and years later, just a few years ago, I found out that I have Quaker ancestry that I had no idea. I did some ancestry research, and because of all the wonderful records they had, I found that in the 1600s, um, a pair of Quaker brothers, last name Eubanks, came from England to Talbot, Maryland. And they were indentured servants. And the one that was my ancestral grandfather married the boss's daughter and inherited <laughs> all of his property because of the way the times were. And at some point, generations later, they moved to North Carolina and I found them in Jones County. But my question is, the only, unfortunately, the only <coughs> thing I can find in the last one, uh, Louisa Eubanks' father, Lot Eubanks, was a newspaper advertisement for a runaway slave. This was in 1829. And he was offering $25 for an enslaved woman and her two children. So listening to this today, it makes me think that maybe he must have backed away from his Quaker faith unless there were still Quakers holding slaves in the 1820s. It was 
one of those things, I, I'm going to liken it to something that I, I, I don't want to offend anyone. But, um, you know, Baptists don't drink. Okay. Quakers don't drink either. And I don't. Um, but it's one of those things that officially, and as much as the, the meeting itself could control it, it was out. And they would disown people who did not toe the line. I mean, you can look back. Many, this is one of the problems that Quakerism did to itself. If you didn't toe the line, you were out. Well, if you add that to the fact that you can only marry someone who is also a Quaker, you really start to limit things and you start shrinking numbers. Um, and that really happened through the 19th century. Um, there was a case in Perquimans of um, a Nathan Winslow who was disowned for continuing to own slaves, and this was probably a little later than what you're talking about. But they couldn't make him stop attending meeting for worship. He wouldn't stop. He wouldn't get rid of the slaves, but he wouldn't stop going to worship. Um, and eventually, uh, his slaves were free, and he gave land to them, and those descendants took the Winslow name and are still living in the Whiteston community, some of them, today. Um, it's also like someone that I've worked with some years ago said, you know, he said, well, Quakers didn't do this, and Quakers didn't do that. And she said, um, if they weren't doing it, why were they making rules against doing it? <laughs> <laughs> so you have to consider those things. If it's not a problem, you don't legislate it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, talk about Obed, my farm is, uh, was created by the sale of little small Quaker farms. And they sold them in 1820 and moved to Indiana. Mm -hmm. And most of them, uh, I've got the deeds for them, and most of them were uh, whites. Sounds right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so many left the area. And that's where the meeting house was you were talking about, the Francis Farms. It was back. It's right there on that road. Beyond that. That is mm -hmm. one farm back. You, you talk, touched on how in the 19th century um, there was a trend toward hiring ministry. And is that typical of quicker worship today? Quicker worship today? Uh, again, there is a wide gamut. Um, let me see if I can go back. Um, North Carolina yearly meeting, and I, this is a long way to explain that. North Carolina year, yearly meeting did, was established in 1697, did not experience any type of split until 1904. Part of the reason is friends in North Carolina were so bound up in battling slavery, they didn't have time for all that stuff. It didn't matter if you were Hicksite, Wilburite, Gurneyite, whatever Ike that they came up with, they weren't having it. That it was irrelevant. In the North, all of the yearly meetings fractured time and time again. So there were two Philadelphia yearly meetings and two of this and two of that. Some of those have in recent years reconnected. Some of the divisions are still very bitter. Um, when North Carolina yearly meeting divided in 1904, and it was it was a big chunk that stayed, and then a very small group of meetings, about eight meetings, <coughs> that left, which became North Carolina yearly meeting conservative. That was basically over music and hired pastors. Um, today, you will find the entire range. More northern meetings tend to be what we call unprogrammed, which is they don't have a hired pastor, they don't follow a, um, an order of service, they don't use planned music in worship, 
music is fine, but it needs to be inspired at the moment. Uh, I mean, you don't have to compose it then, but <laughs> let's sing such and such, or someone might stand and sing. Which also happens at Upriver and Piney Woods during our time of open worship. Some might, someone might ask that the congregation sing something that was not planned, or feel led to sing something themselves. Um, within these groups, North Carolina Yearly Meeting Incorporated, which is basically just an umbrella fiduciary that holds property for these two groups into which it just split a few years ago, um, is mainly pastoral, but there are a few non-pastoral meetings within it. North Carolina Yearly Meeting Conservative, all of those meetings are non-pastoral. They're unprogrammed. Piedmont Fellowship um, is generally pastoral, and Evangelical Friends International is not only pastoral, but they are very evangelical, close to being Pentecostal. But all coming out of the same background, the same roots, the same heritage. What about the local Piney Woods and Upriver? Piney Woods and Upriver were part of North Carolina Yearly Meeting, FUM, both pastors. Um, Piney Woods hired its first pastor in the 1920s. Um, and made that, that complete renovation of the building to, to meet that. You know, it was, they were going to change the way they worshipped, so they did the whole thing. Um, Upriver did not hire an outside pastor until 1953, but we have had hired pastors since. We don't write this minute, like a lot of other churches, uh, we're in between. But um, we do incorporate into our time of worship a time of open worship where there is silence and people are um, free to speak as lit. Thank you, Mr. Wixler. That was wow. Okay. Thank you so much. hearing about Baker history and everything and, and thank you so much for all for, for doing all this work with us. Another round of applause.